2061 Odyssey 3 Space Odyssey Series by Arthur C. Clarke Part 3 European Roulette Chapter 25 The Shrouded World During the decade after the ignition of Jupiter and the spreading of the Great Thaw across its satellite system, Europa had been left strictly alone. Then the Chinese had made a swift flyby, probing the clouds with radar in an attempt to locate the wreck of the Shin. They had been unsuccessful, but their maps of Dayside were the first to show the new continents now emerging as the ice cover melted. They had also discovered a perfectly straight, two-kilometer-long feature that looked so artificial that it was christened the Great Wall. Because of its shape and size, it was assumed to be the monolith, or a monolith, since millions had been replicated in the hours before the creation of Lucifer. However, there had been no reaction, or any hint of an intelligent signal, from below the steadily thickening clouds. So, a few years later, survey satellites were placed in permanent orbit, and high-altitude balloons were dropped into the atmosphere to study its wind patterns. Terrestrial meteorologists found these of absorbing interest, because Europa, with a central ocean and a sun that never set, presented a beautifully simplified model for their textbooks. So had begun the game of European roulette, as the administrators were fond of calling it whenever the scientists proposed getting closer to the satellite. After 50 uneventful years, it had become somewhat boring. Captain Laplace hoped it would remain that way, and had required considerable reassurance from Dr. Anderson. Personally, he had told the scientists, I would regard it as a slightly unfriendly act to have a ton of armor-piercing hardware dropped on me at a thousand kilometers an hour. I'm quite surprised the World Council gave you permission. Dr. Anderson was also a little surprised, though he might not have been had he known that the project was the last item on a long agenda of a science subcommittee late on a Friday afternoon. Of such trifles, history is made. I agree, Captain, but we are operating under very strict limitations, and there's no possibility of interfering with the uh, Europeans, whoever they are. We're aiming at a target five kilometers above sea level. So I understand. What's so interesting about Mount Zeus? It's a total mystery. It wasn't even there only a few years ago, so you can understand why it drives the geologists crazy. And your gadget will analyze it when it goes in. Exactly. And I really shouldn't be telling you this, but I've been asked to keep the results confidential and to send them back to Earth encrypted. Obviously, someone's on the track of a major discovery and wants to make quite sure they're not beaten to publication. Would you believe that scientists could be so petty? Captain Lapwiss could well believe it, but did not want to disillusion his passenger. Dr. Anderson seemed touchingly naive. Whatever was going on, and the captain was now quite certain there was much more to this mission than met the eye. Anderson knew nothing about it. I can only hope 
doctor, that the Europeans don't go in for mountain climbing, I'd hate to interrupt any attempt to put a flag on their local Everest. There was a feeling of unusual excitement aboard Galaxy. When the penetrometer was launched and even the inevitable jokes were muted, during the two hours of the probe's long fall toward Europa, virtually every member of the crew found some perfectly legitimate excuse to visit the bridge and watch the guidance operation. Fifteen minutes before impact, Captain Laplace declared it out of bounds to all visitors, except the ship's new steward, Rosie. Without her endless supply of squeeze bulbs full of excellent coffee, the operation could not have continued. Everything went perfectly. Soon after the atmospheric entry, the air brakes were deployed, slowing the penetrometer to an acceptable impact velocity. The radar image of the target featureless, with no indication of scale, grew steadily on the screen. At minus one second, all the recorders switched automatically to high speed. But there was nothing to record. Now I know, said Dr. Anderson sadly, just how they felt at the Jet Propulsion Lab when those first Rangers crashed into the moon, with their cameras blind. Chapter 26, Night Watch Only time is universal. Night and day are merely quaint local customs found on those planets that tidal forces have not yet robbed of their rotation. But however far they travel from their native world, human beings can never escape the diurnal rhythm set ages ago by its cycle of light and darkness. So at 0105 Universal Time, 2nd Officer Chang was alone on the bridge while the ship was sleeping around him. There was no real need for him to be awake either, since Galaxy's electronic sensors would detect any malfunction far sooner than he could possibly do. But a century of cybernetics had proved that human beings were still slightly better than machines at dealing with the unexpected. And sooner or later, the unexpected always happened. Where's my coffee, thought Chang grumpily. It's not like Rosie to be late. He wondered if the steward had been affected by the same melees that had overtaken both scientists and space crew after the disasters of the last 24 hours. Following the failure of the first penetrometer, there had been a hasty conference to decide on the next step. One unit was left, it had been intended for Callisto, but it could be used just as easily here. And anyway, Dr. Anderson had argued, we've landed on Callisto. There's nothing there except assorted varieties of cracked ice. There had been no disagreement. After a 12-hour delay for modification and testing, penetrometer number three was launched into the European cloudscape following the invisible track of its precursor. This time, the ship's recorders did get some data. For about half a millisecond, the accelerometer on the probe, which was calibrated to operate up to 20,000 G, gave one brief pulse before going off scale. Everything must have been destroyed in very much less than twice the twinkling of an eye. After a second, and even gloomier, post-mortem, it was decided to report to Earth and wait in high orbit round Europa for any further instructions before proceeding to Callisto and the Outer Moons. 
Sorry to be late, sir, said Rose McMahon. One would never guess from her name that she was slightly darker than the coffee she was serving. But I must have set the alarm wrong. Lucky for us, the officer of the watch said with a chuckle, that you're not running the ship. I don't understand how anyone could run it, answered Rose. It all looks so complicated. Oh, it's not as bad as it looks, said Chang. And don't they give you basic space theory in your training course? Er, yes, but I never understood much of it. Orbits and all that nonsense. Second Officer Chang was bored, and felt it would be a kindness to enlighten his audience. And although Rose was not exactly his type, she was undoubtedly attractive. A little effort now might be a worthwhile investment. It never occurred to him that, having performed her duty, Rose might like to go back to sleep. Twenty minutes later, Second Officer Chang waved at the navigation council and concluded expansively, See? So you see, it's really almost automatic. You only have to punch in a few numbers and the ship takes care of the rest. Rose seemed to be getting tired. She kept looking at her watch. I'm sorry, said the suddenly contrite Chang. I shouldn't have kept you up. Oh no, it's extremely interesting. Please go on. Definitely not. Maybe some other time. Good night, Rosie, and thanks for the coffee. Good night, sir. Stuart Third Class Rose McCullen glided, not too skillfully, toward the still open door. Chang did not bother to look back when he heard it close. It was thus a considerable shock when, a few seconds later, he was addressed by a completely unfamiliar female voice. Mr. Chang, don't bother to touch the alarm button. It's disconnected. Here are the landing coordinates. Take the ship down. Slowly wondering if he had somehow dozed off and was having a nightmare, Chang rotated his chair. The person who had been Rose McCullen was floating beside the oval hatchway, steadying herself by holding on to the locking lever of the door. Everything about her seemed to have changed. In a moment of time, their roles had been reversed. The shy steward, who had never before looked at him directly, was now regarding Chang with a cold, merciless stare that made him feel like a rabbit hypnotized by a snake. The small but deadly-looking gun nestling in her free hand seemed an unnecessary adornment. Chang had not the slightest doubt that she could very efficiently kill him without it. Nevertheless, both his self-respect and his professional honor demanded that he should not surrender without some sort of struggle. At the very least, he might be able to gain time. Rose, he said, and now his lips had difficulty in forming a name that had suddenly become inappropriate. This is perfectly ridiculous. What I told you just now, it's simply not true. I couldn't possibly land the ship by myself. It would take hours to compute the correct orbit, and I need someone to help me. A co-pilot, at least. The gun did not waver. I'm not a fool, Mr. Chang. This ship isn't energy limited, like the old chemical rockets. The escape velocity of Europa is only three kilometers a second. Part of your training is an emergency landing with the main computer down. Now you can put it into practice. The window for an optimum touchdown at the coordinates I gave you opens in five minutes. That type of abort, said Chang, now beginning to sweat profusely, has an estimated 25% failure rate. The true figure was 10%, but in the circumstances, he felt that a little exaggeration was justified, and it's years since I checked on it. In that case, answered Rose McCullen, I'll have to eliminate you and ask the captain to send me someone more qualified. Annoying, because we'll miss this window and have to wait a couple of hours for the next one. Four minutes left. Second Officer Chang knew when he was beaten, 
but at least he had tried. Let me have those coordinates, he said. 